thank you everybody for, for turning up and, and attending today's lecture. Uh, my name is Robert Nessig. I'm a senior structural design engineer with TJ Engineers. Um, I've, um, we are a multi-discipline practice, not only timber, we, we design steel, concrete and all the other types of materials as well. But we have a specialty focus on large timber buildings. Large timber portal frames um, is a specialty of mine and I've been doing them for about 30 years now and coming up with systems that are viable and economical to compete against traditional steel, not only in the decorative market or the architectural market, but also in the industrial market as well. So today's presentation, we'll go through um, so briefly uh, through some elements in the types of building environments that timber portal frames are, are used in, the geometric forms that are capable of, of timber frames. Uh, we'll look at some structural sections, what's commonly available and um, most economical to use in some of these items uh, of these buildings. We'll look at some design aspects. We won't go into too much detail in design, but just highlight some of the things that need to be considered during portal frame design. And we'll look at some construction apps aspects as well. In, in definitely with timber, there's some challenging things on site that we need to take into account, uh, and we'll go through those as well. We'll also talk about some secondary framing, purlins and girts, uh, ammonians, um, and what's most applicable for those applications. And we'll go through the case study of the Maya timber building. Portal frames uh, are an ideal way to achieve large open spans. Uh, and, and also have areas where we can provide uh, an activity without impedance on the, on the structure. They're ideal from two aspects. They can carry the vertical dead loads, but also take out the horizontal wind loads that may be applied to it. So they're a very efficient system from that point of view. Just briefly, we'll go through some designs and some aspects where they can be used. Um, domestically, they can be used in, in housing, as you can see in the top left and the bottom right, uh, and they become quite ornate and, and also provide a function to the building. Industrial buildings we'll look at. Commercially, the top right is a um, office building in Brisbane, two storey. We have a 12 metre clear span on the underside and a 12 metre clear span on the roof, the first level. Uh, and we have four metre bays in there. It was all prefabbed uh, structure and erected in, in Brisbane. Bottom left, we have a, a, a portal frame system that was converted into a barn, a rural barn, but a residential uh, structure within that system as well. They can be used in large um, sporting arenas. So the top left is the Netball Centre in Sydney. Uh, the right-hand side is a structure in Mount Gambia. Um, it has a timber gantry rail system, so it's got the, the ability to support, uh, I think, from every 10-ton ten gantry crane through there. It's 10 metres high. Uh, it was one of the first large portal frames in Australia to be built uh, back in the 80s. Bottom left-hand side, we have a uh, school hall, which is made out of glue lamb and has some... Um, steel bracing and, and other elements through there to provide the clear span. We can also use them in, uh, in curved glue lamps as the top two to provide a, a, a geometric shape that, that's more pleasing. And portal frames don't necessarily have to be just straight elements, um, as you see in the bottom left. Now we can become creative and come up with other options that uh, provide a, a more uh, a pleasing view. Uh, they're good for swimming pools because they resist corrosion. So with the right mix of fasteners, so stainless steel connectors, uh, the timber in that environment is inert to the chemicals such as chlorine or salt and provides a good option for those kind of environments. Also in the top left is a, um, it's a um, composting shed. So that was designed back in the early 90s in Mildura. The client there used a steel shed um, and because of the high ammonia release from the composting, steel purlins had corroded within a year. Um, 
this shed was designed with a 30 metre span and um, at six metre high at the eaves. All the elements were either hot, dip, galvanised, all the structural elements, all stainless steel fixings and screws. Um, that shed has had no issue uh, for the last 30 odd years through there. So that provides a very inert um, environment for the structure. Uh, as you can see on the top right, we have an industrial shed, so used for just factory type activities, but also we have a public library on the bottom one, which um, yeah, with some uh, curves cut into the LVL provides a very attractive structure. Basically, portal frames can be provided as a skillion system, uh, straight beams or a gable. Uh, we can have curved elements and a curved uh, knee or haunch at the base to provide a uh, connection free section through there or we can provide a, a an arch type structure with a collar tie um, and in some instances that's needed to be to be used yep. as you can see uh, within Australia we have the capability of, of making some of these curved elements so there are a number of glue lamp suppliers who can provide uh, that type of system available um, you need to contact those uh, L, um, providers and to find out the costings involved. Otherwise, we could do it out of segmented uh, other sections of LVL or glue lamp. What's commonly available within Australia in terms of materials for, for portal frames? Uh, in solid sections, we have glue lamp available in radiator pine generally and, or, or a number of other pine products, GL13, but also in GL18 hardwoods and GL17 hardwoods. So they're commonly available and up to, uh, as far as I'm aware, they're up to 1400 in depth and 450 in width. So there's some, some of the large sections are available now within Australia. LVL um, is made within Australia. So we have the ability to um, purchase material locally and generally the billets are 1200 wide and come in various thicknesses up to generally up to 75 mil in thickness. Uh, both of the materials, uh, LVL is available in 13.6 and, and with special orders available in longer length. Uh, glue lamb is made to order. It just depends on the capacity of the plant. So generally, you get some fairly large size. Um, generally, what we find in large industrial warehouses that the box beam system are the most effective and cost effective means of uh, providing sections so you can see in that lower diagram we have a LVL box beam which uses LVL sheets as the webs and inside within that web we have what we call cross banded so not only do all the not not all the fiber is running longitudinally a number of the veneers are turned perpendicular to provide stability at, to the timber so during its lifespan it doesn't shrink and swell and provides the ability to screw and place fixings at um, regular centres. An alternative to the web is a plywood web. So within Australia, we have a number of plywood manufacturers who provide up to 50 mil thick in 1200 deep sheets of ply. So we could do it as a plywood box boom if we wish. And generally the flange is a sawn timber or LVL. Blue lamb can be used if it's a decorative situation, but um, generally the cost is the issue there. So on the bottom right hand corner, you can see there a typical box beam type section of LVL. Um, you can see the distinct flanges and webs, and they were glued and screwed or glued and nailed together in the process. Just, uh, I've provided this table, which will provide just rust sizing. Um, it's not, not um, I wouldn't take it as gospel, but it depends on the locality and, and what kind of roof loads. But just generally for a, a lightweight roof uh, shed, so, 10 to 15 kilograms, uh, no lining. These are the types of member sizes that you would generally adopt uh, for the different types of spans and spacing. So as you can see in the 10 metre, six metre bay application, you know, we're looking around the 420 to the 470 mark, depending on which product we're using. And a slight increase when we go to eight metre bays. But you know, a 20 metre span, portal frame, 675 LVL or all the alternatives in, in glue lamb are available, eight metre bays through there. Generally, we find in large timber portal frame type applications, the wider the bay we can make it, the so eight, 10 metres, et cetera, or even greater, uh, depending on the, on the structure. 
will provide a more cost-effective uh, solution to the, to the structure. Uh, 40 metres clear spans, so uh, single clear span, you know, 1,200 deep box beams, those kind of sizes are needed and, and glue lamps of similar depth as well would be required to do those things. Um, a 10 metre bay, 40 metre span, um, we would look at a box beam with a knee brace type structure to provide um, the, the, the ability and that depth. So typically on the left, um, on anything larger than 40 metres or larger than 30 metres, we try, so if, if you're looking at a 60 metre wide structure, we, we look at it um, providing an internal prop column type system. And that allows us to then get away with a solid sections. So the more fabrication that's required uh, to make box beams, et cetera, the cost uh, is, is, is higher. So therefore we want to maximize our use on those. We push the portals further apart, but in cases where we can use solid sections, such as LBL or glue limb, uh, the introduction of column will enable us to, to use solid sections, which reduces the cost of fabrication. Plywood box beam portal is the one on the right. That there, um, 800 deep section, 12 meter span, seven meters high, has an unusual cranked shape uh, as part of the form, and it had to match a particular type of timber internal uh, of the main building beside it, uh, a very light wood color, and so we provided a design for a structure of a box beam where we, and then on the external base they glued a, uh, a B grade veneer ply. Uh, radiator pie, which then gave it the seamless look of a solid timber, and there was significant cost savings in the box beam in the connection to the school. Design, generally, AS1720 is a very good design code when you compare it to design codes around um, the, the you know, different precincts, and especially Europe and America. We have we did a lot of research in the early days, back in the 60s, and a lot of the data that's in there is uh, relevant today still in terms of fixings. We have a degree of uh, confidence in those designs and, and then fixing data, but also built in some, you know, some conservatism in terms of the movement of the joints. Um, we, our values that are published in there already cater for the movement or the, or the embedment within the joints. So, you need to take that into account. So generally dead load flexion is uh, the governing criteria for deflection of, of beams or deflection of portal frames. So take that needs to be considered and, 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 and um, designed for. With portal frames, um, we can use camber to reduce the, the dead load deflection effects. So, um, with such large portal frames, we are able to pre-camber up the elements in the glue lamb by having them curved. We're doing box beams. We then pitch the, the ridge up higher than we would normally and bring the columns in to cater for the, the dead load deflection. So it shouldn't become the governing factor um, in, in most instances, uh, but it, it should be able to be designed out. So sometimes we see very large member sizes and that's because of dead load deflection, but we can we can uh, reduce the member size and make it strength dependent generally if we, we uh, put some pre-camber in. Joint stiffness needs to be taken into account. We find that um, the joint rotation at a knee joint or an apex joint can add in the dead load deflection case about 10 to 20% rotation. You tend to find that small fasteners, screws and, and code screws and dowels uh, will provide a stiffer joint than uh, a, a small number of bolts in the joint, but that's not to say you can't use bolts. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure that that's catered for in the design. Um, and then with bolts, normally you have a slightly oversized hole, so you need to take into account that slip that may occur where screws, self-drilling screws are a tight fit, so there's no initial slip, but you do get some embedment, so you get additional joint rotation. Appendix E um, is a very un underutilized area of our timber code and it has a high degree of, um, well, it gives us the ability to design members in portal frames with um, some other benefits and, and taking into account the actual material properties. The section three of the code is very conservative. It's based on a, on a constant moment diagram, whereas if you go to a you can take into account the bending moment shape and the lateral support locations, 
you can take into account having uh, lateral supports on the tension edge rather than the compression edge uh, when you're, you, you're looking at members. And there's a, generally a, a, a benefit in going into Appendix E for rafters and column design as well. Sometimes we use partial fixed bases. So because we have such large members um, attaching to the base uh, connection or place plate, we find that we can take some um, degree of fixity at the base. And that's generally, I adopt that only in lateral cases. So lateral wind, as, as it is a short term load, but where we have long term loads, I tend to think it's at the base. Connections. Um, multitude of types of connections and cost dependent. So external gussets, generally, whether they're steel or plywood is going to be the most economical, not the most pretty, uh, but they provide the most economical design um, and also provide the, the best outcome. Uh, slotted places at the bottom right hand corner, we have some bolts, we have a member that's slotted for a 10 mil steel plate, so that provides a reasonable connection through there. Um, and you still see the fasteners in connection. Common grooves, so you can also, similar to what George had in his presentation, we have three elements of, of uh, LVO glued up as the column and the centerpiece extends up. And then we also have three elements for the rafter and this centerpiece is short at the end so that we can overlap them and screw them together. That's a very cost effective and easy to install system. You can then go to some prefabricated bracketry that's exposed or hidden within elements and that becomes quite expensive, but may perform and provide a different aesthetic to the structure. There are some other types of connection details. So the bottom uh, photo is of a knee brace system. So that's a very economical, may not be the most attractive, but it has its function in certain structures. You have proprietary systems, that's the one um, in the top left, which is from Xband in New Zealand and Australia, a joint effort there to develop that system, which is a very simple bolted connection on site, but a glued and screwed um, plates that are attached to each of the elements. Or you go for a prefabricated horn system as the top right. Base plates can be fairly basic, um, an external bracket attached to the external part of the column or, or um, a hidden base bracket with connections concealed or a plated system or fin plate that's then welded to the casting plate on the slab. So we don't have any visible base bracket. Construction, uh, generally find that construction can be an issue, especially in, in high rain periods or very high heat periods. So um, embers is a product or material that moves when it's wet or dry. So we try to minimize um, the exposure to the elements. And unfortunately, the picture on the right shows uh, one of our systems not well pro protected after it was um, installed. So um, they're busily re-cladding that so that it's protected. But we suggest a protective wrap um, across all elements, protective paint coatings. In impact protection. So you just got to make sure that at low levels, you may need to put a, a false piece of plywood or board on there to protect it while it's um, during construction phase. And the use of soft slings for lifting, not chain, as uh, most riggers would like to use. Avoid wetting from rain, so beams and joints swell. Uh, at, in, if, in, when we've got large sections of timber that are 1200 deep, uh, that moisture uptake can cause some large movements and we don't want to put added, added stress on our joints. So it's important to keep, keep them as dry as possible. And also to avoid checks and splits during drying phase in the summer. Uh, secondary framing, generally, if it's under six metres, we can use sawn timber, LVL or glue lamb, depending on its appearance. As you can see, the top um, element there, um, is a, an I-beam, so you can also use I-beams as well in, in these kinds of structures. Six to eight metres, solid sections, LVL and glue lamb, and I-beams. Greater than eight metres, I-beams are more suitable, and you do have a, a good range of I-beams available, up to 450 in depth um, from, from a number of our suppliers, but also make box beams as well. So as you'll see in the next the case study on the My Timber, we used box beam 
purlins. And the reason there was we had to span 15 metres for our purlins. So that's, that's partly the reason we, we used them there. So next we're going on to the case study, Maya Timber Penrith, New South Wales, 22,000 square metre warehouse. Largest timber, I'm going to claim this, it's the largest timber frame in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, taking into account the, the office building, I believe it's the largest timber warehouse in the Southern Hemisphere. We have two 29 metre spans each side with a central span of 32, as you can see, and a, can and a canopy of nine metres. Through this, a fairly large open plan structure through there. The main frames were 1200 deep box beams glued and screwed. The LVLs webs were 42 mil LVL with two cross bands and a 150 by 90 top and bottom cord. Columns were a tongue and groove system, so the, the columns were actually wider so that the rafter could slip in between the webs and the elements were screwed off through there. Base spacings were 15 metres. This was adopted because it gave the best layout for the racking system. We considered 10 metre base, but 15 provided the additional uh, lane within each, between each column systems. And the structure was 22, 220 metres long, 600 deep box beam pounds. This structure during its design phase was compared against steel and, and it provided a cost effective uh, system. So once again, there's the geometry through there. So it was nine metres high at the eaves. Um, you can see the screw joint through there. So that we provided a pattern of, of uh, type 17 type screws. When it was erected, only a certain number of outer rings of screws were, were applied to take the dead load of the beams. And then once that was off the hook and they could come back and finish up the screw ring later. The, the internal column was the box section, as well as the uh, main roof members and columns. So as you can see, it's a fairly impressive large structure, uh, fairly regular, which makes for the size of economy. Uh, and the bay spacings are 15 metres, and overall what you see there is, is 90 metres through there. Internally, you see this matchstick through there where we have uh, LVL, mullions and, and girts in some applications along the building and construction adopted a prefabbed system whereby every alternative bay was prefabbed on the ground as a modular unit and then lifted up into place uh, to columns as you can see there and then slipped into a place so you can see them lifting that middle section through there once it was uh, in position they screwed off a number of rings screws and then the cranes could be released thank you very much